Hey, and here's my AP Statistics 10 minute review here. I'm gonna try to keep it to 10 minutes. Um, this is obviously not every single thing you need to know in the class, but it's trying to be a, give a big highlight and some important tips for the AP exam. So first off, first unit, describing data. You're gonna usually be asked to ask a question on the FRQ that's asking about, you know, something with like box plots, dot plots, histograms, stem plots, maybe even, um, yeah, those are the main plots. When you're asked to describe that, make sure you hit up the four points, the shape, that is whether it's skewed or not, whether it's unimodal or bimodal, the spread, that could be describing the range, the IQR, the standard deviation, or make sure you know what those are, the center, which could be the mean or the median, and finally outliers, anything beyond two standard deviations of the mean or outside the 1.5 IQR fence. Make sure you know how to do all of those things as well as the five number summary, which is the min, max, um, Q1, median and q3 when you're analyzing scatter plots and you're looking at them they want you to show strength of the association that's whether it's strong moderate or weak the direction whether it's positive or negative positive meaning was one variable goes up the other goes up negative meaning the opposite one goes up the other goes down the shape whether it's linear or curved and then any outliers anything far away from the general trend you want to make sure you hit those points when you're asked to describe data for those kinds of um, situations Collecting data. So here is where we talk about sampling and bias and you know how we do op experiments versus observational studies. The different methods of sampling, you got simple random sample, that's where you just take everyone and you randomly pick from the entire population. They're stratified where you're, where you're grouping them into groups first and then picking from within the group, okay? So what you're doing is you're stratifying by a variable you think that is you know important to separate because you wanna make sure, for example, you might wanna know, you know, I wanna get men and women and I wanna you know, make sure I get an even number of men and women. So I may separate them first and randomly select from those two groups. As opposed to cluster where things are naturally grouped, I'm gonna randomly pick one of the groups and sample everyone within that group. I don't get everyone from every group. I for example, like in clustering, you may say, if you're gonna sample at your school, you may randomly pick a classroom and then sample everyone in that classroom, okay? As opposed to stratifying, which you would be grouping, maybe by like 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, and randomly selecting from within that group. That's the difference between stratified and clustered. Convenience is just something that you do that's easy for you to do. That is, you grab people who are walking into school, or you just do something that's that's it's not it's not necessarily random or not fully random. Systematic is something like you take every tenth item or every fifth item or something like that. Something you just kind of systematically do for your sampling. Okay. Now, when you're collecting data and you're, you're sampling or you're doing surveys, there are various kinds of bias that can be involved. There's non-response bias. That's where people who don't answer might have a different different makeup or different behavior than the people who do answer. There's under coverage where you're sampling a group of people, but you're not necessarily grabbing from the whole population. Okay. Uh, voluntary responses, people who do respond tend to have a very, very strong opinion. Like people who leave Yelp reviews, usually people who love it or usually people who hate it. It's not usually like the mediocre people who just be like, yeah, hey, it was fine. Response is the way that the, the study is done that may introduce um, the response to lean in one way. Um, as an example, it's not, th that's different from the wording bias, which is how the question is worded. The response bias is like, for example, if you have, if I'm asking you, have you ever broken the law and it's an anonymous survey as opposed to you randomly get selected, you go talk to a police officer and they ask you, have you ever broken the law? You may answer the question a little bit differently because of the situation, not because of the way it was worded, but because of the situation. Wording bias is the way the questions are asked may affect the way people lean one way or the other. Now, when you're asked about bias about one of these things, be specific about how the bias affects it. You want to say something like, in my example with the police officer, I might say, well, the police officer is intimidating and a person might be more inclined to lie and say they haven't broken the law when in fact they have. Okay, so they're more likely to say no because of that. So you want to be specific on how the bias actually affects the answer to the, the, the situation there. Don't just say that the presence of the police officer would cause bias or response bias. You need to be more specific about how it affects the response, okay? And then experiment versus observational study. Experiments are the only way we do causality. 
okay? We always we can only show association by observational studies. And the difference between experiments and observational studies is in experiments you are randomly forcing people to or you know the the things under treatments and you're randomly assigning them into treatments. You are not letting them self select. For example, suppose I want to know if smoking causes cancer. Okay? Observational studies, I study the people who have smoked and the study people who haven't smoked and I and I observe the incident rates of cancer. That's an observational. I did not force them to smoke or not. Experiment would be like I take two random groups of people, I force this group of people to smoke, I force this group of people to not smoke, and then I compare their results. Okay? Now experiments can show causality more directly. A lot of the times experiments are immoral. Like that would be a very immoral and illegal experiment to do, to force these people to smoke and force these people to not smoke. That would be, you know, inappropriate and illegal and unethical ultimately um, to do. So that's why sometimes we only use observational studies because we cannot perform experiments for whatever reason. Probability. This is a tough topic sometimes. So I'm going to try to, and there's a lot and in deep in here. So make sure you feel good about the probability, but you always get a probability FRQ. So first, when asked to describe a distribution, you need to identify the name of the distribution as well as the parameters associated with that. For example, if I ask you if you know something's a binomial distribution, know the conditions. What is a binomial distribution? But it's described by the number of trials n and by the probability p. Those parameters are given to you on your formula sheet if you want to look at them. Um, but it, it's good for you to know. Geometric distribution is described by the probability p of failure or the first success or failure. Depends on what you define. Success and failures are not really like they, they have no specific context, specific meanings. They're driven by the context of the uh, what you're trying to count, basically. So normal distribution is always described by a mean and a standard deviation. So if I'm asking you to describe what is the distribution, don't just tell me the name. Don't just say binomial, geometric, or normal. Tell me the parameters, these parameters and those values associated with that distribution. Make sure you understand the difference between a sampling distribution and a population distribution, okay? Well, like a sample mean or something like that. Make sure you know conditional probability, right? That's if something is conditioned on an event and what that means and what independence ultimately means as relation to conditional probability. And then here I want to hit up because I know this is an area that a lot of students struggle with, so I want to focus on this. Know how the different transformations can affect the mean and standard deviation. For example, if I take a random variable and multiply it by a constant, the mean and standard deviation both multiply by that constant. As opposed to taking a random selection. So, so for example, suppose I know the distribution weight of like um, a marble has a weight of a mean mu and a standard deviation blah. And I take the weight of one marble and multiply it by 10, then the mean and standard deviation multiply by 10. However, in contrast, if I take 10 random marbles, all with those same distribution, then the mean is n times that mean, and the standard deviation gets multiplied by the square root of n. Okay? There's a difference between that. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean the mean weight. I meant if I took 10 marbles and added the weight of every marble, but each marble was independent and had its own distribution, then the standard deviation doesn't get multiplied by n. It gets multiplied by the square root of n. There's a difference between me randomly selecting 10 things versus me randomly selecting one thing and multiplying it by 10. So make sure you understand that difference. And when you add two random variables, two, if they're, the, the means always add. So you just add the means, the mean of x plus the mean of y. The standard de deviation adds by kind of like this, some people call the Pythagorean theorem of um, random variables, is basically you add the square root of the square of the standard deviations. Now that's only if x and y are independent. You can't just do that for any two random variables you add. It must be explicitly stated that x, that those two random variables are independent if you do that. The mean ones you can always add regardless of they're independent or not. Okay. Hypothesis testing. I have another video where I go through all the different hypothesis testings. Um, but if you're performing a hypothesis test or a confidence interval, Here's the name. Here's the things you want to do. You want to state the conditions and show how they're being met in the question. They're usually pretty short to show, but make sure you understand the three conditions for all of the the normal distribution issue um, uh, ones, and then the conditions for um, 
uh, chi squared. There's always three conditions. It's the random independence, and then for you know the the z or t tests, it's um, normal conditions, and for chi squared, it's the expected counts. But know how they're different for proportions, for sample means, for the chi squared. That other video kind of goes through that. Make sure you name the test specifically. I don't know how many times you just tell me not the name of the function on the calculator is okay, but I would prefer, and it's better if it's very clear. You identify whether it's a one or two sample, whether it's a proportion versus a sample mean, whether it's z versus t, and then for chi squared, that's a separate thing. You can just say chi squared for that. Okay, name that specifically because the calculator functions say like one sample. One sample is not clear necessarily. I prefer you say one sample mean because it is technically sample mean, not just a sample. Proportions are always samples also, but we call it. So use things like one prop z test or two sample mean t test or something like that. Make sure you state the null and alternative hypothesis. Show both the test statistic and the p-value, even when you're using a calculator. I know your conclusion is just based on the p-value, but show the test statistic as well as the p-value, and then write an appropriate conclusion in context. For a confidence interval, it's basically identical, except that rather than um, showing the p-value, you're going to show what the confidence interval is. Okay, instead, and then write an appropriate conclusion for that. Like I said, I'll put a link in the description below to that other video on hypothesis testings um, because that one's a little bit longer to understand if you're having trouble identifying it. Okay, so those are the main ideas on the FRQs and the topics that you should look at. Obviously, it's not exhaustive, but hopefully, it gives you a pretty good idea of the things that you should be doing.